It is a great pleasure for me to be here today and to the exercise of exploring the past, present, and future of human rights in the European Union is a particularly fitting task for a representative of the European Parliament. For, as we know, the European Parliament is often the beacon and the driving force behind the promotion of human rights in Europe and beyond. I am honored by your invitation to be here and delve more deeply into the tools that the European Union, and in particular the European Parliament, possess in promoting human rights, the achievements that they can speak of, and the future goals that they can set for themselves. Uh, human rights, as we know, are a universal value, which is above individual interest, even at the highest level. And therefore, it must be protected always and everywhere. We know that the sources of human rights in European philosophy and politics, so they date back to the natural right and to some uh, Renaissance theories concerning human dignity and um, human liberty. So at the same time, of course, they are inseparable from the legacy of uh, English liberals and French and the French Enlightenment, the French Revolution with the concept of human rights and the rights of every human being. Uh, and yet what is um, quite important, not to say extraordinary nowadays, is that something that um, had long been um, just a property of some humanist thinkers, political philosophers, now became almost a criterion which allows us, which allows us to, well, to, to assess countries in terms of their democratic performance, in terms of their respect for human rights and human dignity. So now we try to mainstream human rights, trying to perceive them as an instrument, as a tool, and as a criterion. Uh, we do well to explore human rights in a broad context in political and moral theories, but the real question for the European Union is what can we do practically? What can we achieve? Because human rights, of course, is very far from just a theoretical matter. We can employ many good philosophical concepts and many quite fascinating things, but the point is what can we do to achieve something and to make a difference in the world? Um, what can the European Parliament do for human rights? Uh, for the defenders of human rights in those states uh, which have, over which we have limited political leverage? And how can each individual member of the European Parliament fulfill the obligations to her or his citizens by doing something tangible, practical, and productive? These questions are particularly interesting to me because I spent much of my time studying human rights from the theoretical angle. But to now be in a position where I have the precious opportunity to make an impact and a difference is extremely rewarding. Therefore, today I will concentrate on the present endeavors of the European Union in the sphere of human rights, as well as future prospects rather than dwelling on the past. The evolution of human rights um, work in the external relations of the Union very much followed its internal developments. As European countries progress themselves in setting higher and higher human rights standards, so the Union's efforts at promoting human rights beyond its own borders increased. Twenty years ago, many of the new member states still applied capital punishment as part of the judicial system. Today, the EU insists on in including clauses, clauses on bans of, on capital punishment in all significant and close agreements of cooperation with third countries. As the successful project of enlargement took place, so the Union's external human rights work grew in scope and depth. And in fact, let me just interrupt myself and to set an example, uh, I remember quite well how my country, Lithuania, was striving for membership in the EU. And at the time, it was in the early 90s, um, I think a large segment of population still thought of capital punishment as something that was taken for granted, something that was quite just in their perception. It took some time to convince society that that was barbaric, that that was something that should have been simply put aside of our discourses and practices. And yet this is a very important example of how post-Soviet and post-communist countries started a reading of the legacy of violent politics, of violent politics and uh, very violent practices that were taken for granted for a long time. Um, I am convinced that the European Union is an invaluable international force in terms of this kind of work. It is often a beacon as well as an inspiration to the rest of the world. And by using its soft power, 
can often extract tangible and satisfying results from its partner countries. Much of the human rights work which takes place, for instance, at the European Parliament consists of hearings, seminars, discussions, and other events focusing on specific topics. Throughout the last year, I myself, if I'm allowed to mention myself, um, I have organized hearings on the human rights situation in Ukraine, Syria, Armenia. I met with human rights defenders from North Korea, China, Russia, and discussed such issues in the Subcommittee on Human Rights, of which I am the coordinator of my political group, the Alliance of Liberal and Democrats for Europe. Needless to say, what is very precious here is that, as an academic, of course, I did my utmost studying dissent, dissidents, human rights all over the world, but when you get the instruments organizing the hearings with North Korean, Russian dissidents, this is something quite different. Yes, I used to invite people like Sergei Kovalev, a glorious dissident from Russia, the memorial people to Lithuania, organizing seminars and conferences at my university uh, in Kaunas, Vitaltas Magnus University. But when you get a chance to organize the hearings which bring the experiences of these people to the European Union, this is another story. And concerning this possibility somehow to unite thought and action, our vision and action, is something very precious which I appreciate really much in the European Parliament. Uh, through these hearings and discussions, the Parliament, the European Parliament, is not only informed about a huge range of human rights problems in different areas of the world, but is also able to galvanize this knowledge in preparing resolution, the marches, declarations, consultations, dialogues, delegations, and other types of instruments with which to influence the human rights situation in the world. Another such instrument, which is very important in my view, is the annual award, uh, the annual awarding of the Sakharov Prize for freedom of thought. The prize is awarded to individuals or organizations for particular achievement in the fields of defense of human rights and fundamental freedoms, the safeguarding of the rights of minorities, the respect for international law, or the development of democracy and the implementation of the rule of law. Receiving such a prize provides not only a great amount of international attention, coverage, and encouragement, but also gives a much needed financial reward which can be used to fund human rights activities of activists, who often have next to no resources. In 2009, I pushed for the prize to be awarded to human rights defenders in Russia. I mentioned the memorial, which is, I think, the most respected and the most uh, quoted and acknowledged the human rights organization in Russia, the memorial, which includes people like Gennady Orlov, like uh, Sergei Kovalev, some other glorious Russian human rights defenders. And I was really happy. I think that that was a high point in my political life to see these people get this award. And this year I sought to recognize the tireless efforts of human rights defenders working in North Korea, but this time I had less success and I think that someone else will receive the Sakharov Prize this year. Despite all these achievements, um, EU human rights work is far from being a straightforward success story. This is the case for two reasons, and we have to admit it. Firstly, the EU sometimes still struggles to be the champion of human rights that it aspires to be or to follow all the recipes it preaches to third countries. Take, for example, the recent mass expulsions of the Roma by France. Take the blatant homophobia which still exists even in my own country, and uh, I have to say that that was one of the most unpleasant experiences for me as a Lithuanian, that my country, on the very same day when the European Parliament started working, that was on the 14th of July in uh, 2009, passed a bill that was the law on the protection of minors from the detrimental effect of public information. And that was a disgraceful law which smacked censorship, which was very homophobic. And yes, and we had to struggle. We had to struggle, and this made me, this made me realize that, you know, there is no point in targeting some countries and trying to reduce the old human rights defense work to do it, instead of sometimes to living up to the standards and values that we are raising ourselves in the European Union. So honestly, when I think of the, of the public information law project, the bill in Hungary, which smacks censorship, or about the outbreak of homophobia in Lithuania. So I find myself thinking that much remains to be done, 
to live up to those standards that we are setting for the European Union. So and we have to focus on the European Union, sometimes even with more detail and more, um, more commitment than we do with regard to the countries that are obvious, too obvious to, to, to make a problem, so to say. It's obvious that Russia or Iran are violating human rights every day. But I think at the same time we have to do something to apply the same standards and criteria to ourselves. And this is, I think, a very valuable lesson nowadays. Otherwise, we would lose our credibility, our legitimacy, our moral credit, and um, our moral authority. And I think that moral authority of Europe is one of the most important properties and, and things that allow us to achieve many things here. Uh, or, for instance, um, For instance, um, we have to remember that some may member state interest in human rights in third countries are inconsistent as well, rendering any collective EU level efforts near impossible. For example, the human rights abuses of its own citizens carried out by Russia in Chechnya during the two Chechen wars, or the repression of the freedom of speech in the country even today. Even in the face of ample evidence and calls from various actors from the international community, the EU still does extremely little to try to better the human rights situation in Russia. And why is that? Individual member states' interests, their economic ties with Russia, the EU dependence on Russian gas, the inability to find a systematically coherent strategy towards the country are all crucial factors in this to an extent hypocritical stance by the EU. And we have to admit this because uh, well, it's okay. Sometimes we um, can find ourselves to very standard judgment saying that we are not content with this or that, say in Russia, but the fact remains that we have to do something about the country which methodically exterminates its critics and opponents. Uh, the very same day that we started our work in the European Parliament was marked not only by a disgraceful law adopted by Lithuania, but by the massacre of Natalia Estemirova a courageous journalist in Russia, in Chechnya. So, and that was a horrible story. And needless to say, a country that, instead of simply silencing its opponents and critics, methodically exterminates them. So I think that this country has to be treated with all our principled fashion and sincerity. And we don't have to lower the standards only because some countries perform extremely well from the economic standpoint. So a good economic performance is not an excuse. It's not an excuse, and I think that one of the worst nightmares that uh, could happen in our world is a kind of the concept of good economic performance at the expense of human rights and fundamental civil liberties. So that would be the worst case scenario for us, to think that once the country has the free market economy and is doing fine, so let's shut one eye on some inconsistencies or bad things because it is one step forward, so to say, and this would be a fundamentally wrong strategy. Uh, the inconsistency in the interest in human rights issues by member states can also be seen by the attention, financial or otherwise, that the EU gives to geographical areas such as Africa or the Middle East, as opposed to areas like Central Asia or the CIS countries. Many of the older EU member states are not too familiar with the situation in the former Soviet republics, at least not to the extent that they are familiar with countries that they have close economic or even colonial ties with. Let me remind you that, needless to say, for obvious reasons, uh, we are quite sensitive in Europe concerning Northern Africa, we are very sensitive towards the Sub-Saharan Africa or the Middle East, and rightly so, but I was struck by the fact that when I raised the issue of Kyrgyzstan and the possibility of the, break, of the outbreak of violence, nobody took it seriously. Although for me it was quite obvious that the violence could result from the, from the chaos and mayhem in the country. And it took two or three days and unfortunately, famous last words, I was right. And we were not prepared. And sometimes there is not a single mention of semi-totalitarian, awful regimes like the one in Turkmenistan, for instance. Uh, and it's quite obvious that while trying to assess some dangerous regimes, we shut one eye on something that we take for granted as a difficult post-Soviet you know, area, or, but in fact it's a mistake because we have to be very attentive to the countries where some horrible practices could be developed, or even before our eyes. 
This lack of familiarity manifests itself in a lack of interest in situations which truly merit our attention. And I mentioned Central Asia and Turkmenistan, and they possess truly authoritarian leadership characterized by extremely tight control by the government or even a personality cult. More than that, to the best of my knowledge, in Uzbekistan or Turkmenistan, there is a kind of slavery and even child slavery, which is used for economic purposes. And we cannot, we cannot allow this happen. We cannot allow this happen and pass in silence. Uh, while such a situation is comparable, if not worse, than the one is in, for example, Zimbabwe, which systematically receives considerable international attention, Turkmenistan and its neighbors are often left off the international agenda completely. And getting to the last point, uh, uh, bearing in mind such setbacks in the EU, what conclusions can we draw regarding the EU's human rights work in general today, and what are the prospects for the future? While I have tried to analyze the flaws in the Union's human rights efforts, this was by no means in order to depress the audience or undermine the excellent achievement which the EU can undoubtedly be proud of. However, it is only by criticizing ourselves that we can truly improve and to be the inspiration, the true champion of human rights in the world. Uh, the EU is certainly moving forward, and this is rewarding to watch. It is expanding on its range of instruments, influence, goals. However, the occasional lack of consistency in efforts means that the full potential of human rights work has not yet been realized. I would very much like to see the EU rectify its flaws, continue to expand its efforts to ever more courageous when dealing with third countries and continue to seek to eliminate its setbacks and flaws. It's not very easy. In theory and practice, we know that it's quite challenging. I remember one of the debates in my group, in the liberal groups, and I have to say that uh, that was about China. So with a colleague, we had a conversation this morning about China, and I have to say that that was quite difficult. We started talking about China, and again, that was a sort of something very predictable. They said, we cannot ignore China. China is making considerable progress, you know, and China is very important. Yes, I said, but how about the worsening of human rights situation? I meet Chinese lawyers frequently, and I know that they are disbarred only because they happen to defend innocent people. They defend innocent people, and they lose their profession. Sometimes they lose their liberty and everything, the prospect for the future. But then when I mentioned Tibet, the answer was, you know, I am not very sensitive and not very attentive to that theocratic state. Somebody told me, well, this is so welcome to the beginning of the 21st century. Still so. Sometimes it's difficult to draw the dividing line between the oppressive, the oppressive regime who gives very good economic performance and the oppressed the oppressed people. So we cannot confuse the, the oppressing and the oppressed actors in political life. Otherwise, that would be very, very bad news for the 21st century. Finally, all of European institutions are a part of a whole and are playing their role in this process. And it is their responsibility to ensure the high quality of efforts, political will, consistency, and sensitivity to a variety of issues. The political parliament has a particular role to play in this process, and it is the one institution whose so-called full-time job is to defend human rights both inside the Union and around the world. And personally, as a member of the European Parliament, I will continue to do my utmost in hearing the voices of non-governmental organizations, working with the information inside, knowledge, requests, and recommendations that they can provide for its people on the ground who truly know the story and who, through the European Parliament, can make an impact. And the last but not least, uh, I have to say that, in fact, human rights not only became something, uh, I would say, very closely related to the European values and to the European uh, basic concepts, without which it is hardly possible to imagine Europe itself, but I would like to say that it's something very practical. There is a widespread mistake when human rights are depicted as something very detached, something that you can easily sacrifice for the sake of real politics, real politics, so to say. In fact, it's fundamentally wrong because the way that a government or regime treats its citizens is a message which is being sent to the world about the future of other societies and about the acceptability or inacceptability of some 
rules and criteria that could be used all over the world. So that's why we have to be very attentive. It's something very, very practical, and there is no better criterion or no better way to check what's happening on the ground than to monitor human rights everywhere. And um, I do believe that, of course, we can do it only jointly and only to being more critical of ourselves. My very last point would be that it's not an easy time for Europe, we know, and uh, a number of human rights violations could be observed almost everywhere in the European Union. So that's why I do believe, and this is my very final remark, that from the point of view of human rights, the European Union was and continues to be a success story. It's difficult for me to imagine what would have happened to the Baltic states, and Lithuania in particular, if not our membership in the European Union. Thank you.